verse and verse 10. 1 Timothy 6:10. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. 1 Timothy 6.10 For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Let's bow our hearts down a word of prayer. God and Father, again we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity of looking at your word and studying it together. And as we do so, we pray that the things said and done would honor and glorify the name of Christ It would be edifying to the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, we are continuing and, and probably wrap up today or certainly next week our, our study on giving and, and how, what the Bible has to say about giving. We, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 here, um, we use this passage as sort of our foundation. It, it, it really doesn't talk specifically about giving, but it talks about what our attitude should be about money and about the stuff that money can, can provide for us. The love of money is the root of all evil. And, and you know, as we pointed out, it doesn't say money is the root of all evil. Things are not the root of all evil. Think money and things are just they're, they're, they're inanimate objects. It's how we use them that is the issue. And the love of money, especially when it comes to causing us to err from the faith. Uh, when we err from truth in order to uh, in order to have financial gain uh, or gain in power and prestige or financially or in things or whatever the case might be, um, that's where the problem comes in. And that's true whether it's in, in the, the scientific realm, the medical realm, the, the spiritual realm, political realm, whatever the case might be. When we err from the truth in order to gain, that's when problems start. So, so the, the love of money to the point where, you know, now the, and, you know, say the love of money. Well, how much am I allowed to love money? Well, you're allowed to love money till it causes you to err from the faith. Then you have to stop loving money, all right? So, so when you get to where it, you err from the faith, you sacrifice the truth in order for gain, then that's the problem. So um, that's kind of the foundation that we built on. And then we started looking at uh, three areas, and we'll just quickly review those. Uh, when we talk about giving and how these these principles about money apply to giving, one is the attitude of giving, uh, and we've been looking at each of these things as uh, you know, giving the attitude in the law, the attitude in the kingdom, and the attitude in the dispensation of grace, and see how those differ. Of course, in the in the kingdom and uh, in the law and the kingdom, the attitude of giving is one of fear. Um, they served God because they feared Him, and that fear motivated them to serve. Uh, a fear of, of the curse that would come if they didn't serve motivated them to serve. Uh, same in the kingdom. Ananias and Sapphira found out the hard way that you don't, you don't lie to God about what you give and you give exactly what he prescribes. Um, we talked about how under the law and the kingdom your giving proves God. Uh, they would give and then God says, prove me now herewith. Prove me with your tithes and offerings. And see if I will not open up you the windows of heaven that you can uh, pour you out a blessing there shall not be room enough to receive it. Uh, in the dispensation of grace, giving proves something about us. Paul says it proves the sincerity of our love. So we're always proving something about ourselves and our sincerity as we give, not about God's sincerity and God's love for us. Um, the second issue that we got to after attitude was answer. Almost forgot. Was answer. Um, what do we expect God to do? What do we expect his response to be? Um, under the law... If you give, you know, I'll pour you out. I'll open up a blessing. Pour you out. Uh, open up the windows of heaven. Pour you out a blessing. There shall not be room enough to receive it. If you give properly under the the, the kingdom program, I'm gonna. You you give. You sell all that you have. You come. You get into the kingdom, and I'll provide all that you need. Fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So so the answer under the law and and the kingdom is a definite physical blessing. The answer in the dispensation of grace is different. If you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, just to review the verse where Paul talks about giving in 2 Corinthians, he says this, after he talks about giving, he says in verse 8, and God is able to make all grace, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, so that ye having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. So he's able to make grace abound toward us, not things, not stuff, but grace, just like his answer to Paul was, 
my grace is sufficient. He didn't fix the physical problem, didn't heal him, but he said, my grace is sufficient. And when we give properly with a cheerful heart, not grudging your necessity, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, um, what God makes abound toward us is grace. He doesn't promise to give us things, to give us stuff. Now, there may be benefit from what we give to. We give money to, the, the, you know, to Dan's orphanage in India. There's a benefit there to that. We give money to the work of the ministry. The word of grace goes out. Those are benefits, but not something to you. What you receive is grace and, and eternal blessing uh, through that grace. So the, the result is very different. Um, it's not something that, that, that we, we quantify as it was under the law. Um, just to kind of illustrate, and then, of course, amount. Uh, well, we'll talk about amount a little bit, so here first. Uh, we looked at the amount. Yeah, amount. That's spelled right, isn't it? Well, that's a U. It looks like a tail. Well, what would you think it is? <laughs> it looks like that O had a tail. Oh, my goodness. Write it big. Oh, write it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. All right. Can you see that? Gee whiz. See, I can do it if I take my time, but I just, ooh, it takes so long. Yeah, I, just, yeah, I can't write and talk at the same time. I used to be able to do that, but no more. So we looked at the amount under the law and the kingdom, and we saw that in each case it's a very prescribed amount. The law is 20% every year. You give a tithe for the Lord, a tithe for the, the tribe of Levi. Every year, there's 20% a year. Every third year, you give a tithe for the poor, the fatherless, and the widow, which is 30% every third year. In addition to that, you give the first fruits of, the, of your flock and of your herds, uh, the firstborn. In addition to that, you give heave offerings and wave offerings. In addition to that, you bring sin offerings when you sin. In addition to that, you can bring free will offerings. So there's all kinds of giving under the law, and it's all very structured and prescribed. When you get to the kingdom, of course, everything ramps up. And in the kingdom, uh, we, we learn that you just, you just sell it all. You sell, sell, sell that you have, give alms, come and follow me, and in the kingdom everything will be great. So the, the amount is still prescribed, that is, it, you know, he said, gives a definite amount, it's just that that amount goes up from the 20, 20, 30, and all those other offerings to just sell it all and bring it to me. Um, just to, to sort of... Uh, these first two added, every the, the amount actually always grows out of the attitude and the answer. Um, and, and I, just to illustrate how crazy the evangelical church is about this uh, attitude of giving and why we need to we need to teach about it from the proper perspective. Nobody likes to preach about money because it gets you in trouble, but we need to preach about the proper perspective on this. I watched a video on YouTube this week of, I, I, I think it was Mike Murdoch, um, maybe Ken Copeland, one of those guys um, talking about giving, and, and, and of course they were trying to raise money, and he said, if, if you're in credit card debt, if you're overwhelmed by credit card debt, what you need to do is take one of those credit cards that you can't pay off, that you're overwhelmed with, and give us a contribution on that card, and then God will pay off that card for you. <laughs> now, that is, that is exactly the wrong, the wrong attitude and the wrong answer that you're not going to get. Um, that's not the way, but, but most of Christianity, you know, it might not be quite that blatant, when they present it, but most of Christianity presents it that way. Most of Christianity presents it as you give something so that you get something. And if you want to, you know, get if you want to prosper financially, you have to give to whatever ministry it might be at the time. But that the thing that I saw on, on, on YouTube about, you know, if you if you're if you're overwhelmed with credit card debt, you need to give money on that card that you're overwhelmed by. And then God will pay it off. And so that's just, that's just the living end. I mean, that just shows you how far the evil imagination of man can go in taking God's truth and twisting it to mean something that it, it, it never meant. So 
we're going to try to talk about a mountain today from a little different perspective uh, than the, uh, and I'll tell you right up if you're overwhelmed in credit card debt you shouldn't be putting anything in that box back there you should get out of credit card debt first and then put stuff in that box back there so if you're overwhelmed with credit card debt not only do just put more money on that card for us don't don't do anything destroy till you get that hmm? destroy your card. The, yes the first thing to do is cut up your card Yes, that's that's a good that's a good idea. Um, don't 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 send some preacher money on it. Cut it up, throw it away, burn it, whatever. Um, so, but that's and you know I was I was at mom's house last night, um, and and of course the local TV station is on their annual, semi-annual, monthly, weekly begathon. You know where you give money and and of course they're telling all these stories of people. You know this. Oh, you know you know. Uh, Sarah from Santa Fe called in and she you know, gave $100 and, and she got a check in the mail the next day for $1,000 and blah, 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 you know, all these stories. And, and mom, mom said to me, I don't understand, how can, how can good Christian people say these things if they're not true? And I said, well, the problem is you're starting with the premise that these are good Christian people. Um, and that's the problem. Uh, you know, maybe some of the people being duped into sending that money in are quote good Christian people, but I, I believe more and more that the people at the top of these organizations, it's just another business to make money. It's just another way to make money. And if you're gonna, if you just want to make money, then do something honest, like go sell booze or something. Don't don't try to build money out of people and say it's for God's work. That's just. That just makes it doubly bad. Um, you know, just if you just want to make money, just go make money, and that's fine. You can go make money, but don't make money on the premise of, you know, if you've got credit card debt, put more money on that card and God will pay it off. That's just that's just open charlat charlatanry. Okay, is that a word? They're charlatans, anyhow. So I sound like Joe Biden. Um, that's just they're just charlatans. So all right. So let's get into the the, the amount a little bit. So and one thing to remember: um, turn over to uh, Acts chapter four because I think this is so important and it really does illustrate. Get Acts chapter four and get Galatians chapter two and get Romans chapter fifteen. Get those. Get those. You know, in each hand. Uh, uh, Acts chapter 4, Galatians chapter 2, Romans chapter 15. Because I think this, this principle, and this, this it's not even a principle, it's just events as they unfolded in, in the New Testament. Uh, if we understand that, it really helps us to see uh, the dispensational change that's taking place. If, if nothing else in this idea of, of, of giving and, and what's going on with money helps us to understand that some some radical change has taken place. In Acts chapter 4, verse 32, the kingdom church, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of things that were sold, laid them down at the apostles' feet. Distribution was made to every man according as he had need. This is true communism. This is from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. If you have houses or lands, you sell them, you bring the price, lay it at the apostles' feet, and distribution is made to every man according as he has need. From each according to his ability, you have houses and lands, you sell them, to each according to his need. You have a need, you get it met. It's true, godly communism, not the ungodly kind that they do in Russia and China. This is true, godly communism. But now, the, the question is, how long can that work? If you, as many as were possessors of houses and lands, sold them. So if you live, especially if you live in an agrarian society, an agrarian culture, where you're making money off the land that you own, and you sell all the land that you have, then, then what happens when that money's gone? You're broke. Yes, who said you're broke? That's right. Yeah, you're broke. You can't make more because you're sold. You sold the 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 means of of uh, production. You sold what it was that was producing the revenue. So it's fine to sell it because now you've got that money to live on. But but if something doesn't happen pretty quickly, 
then you're broke, like Donna said. And something didn't happen pretty quickly. That is, the kingdom didn't come. And if you go over to Galatians chapter 2, after Paul meets with Peter, James, and John in Jerusalem, he says this in Galatians 2, 9, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. So that's the agreement that's made there in Acts chapter 15 with Paul and Peter, James, and John. Verse 10, only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I was also forward to do. Only we, they would that we would remember the poor. Now, that poor there is not just, you know, the, the poor you will always have with you, God, or Jesus Christ said. And it's not just about those poor people uh, out there in the world somewhere. It's the poor saints at Jerusalem. Peter, James, and John, you know, they, they understand now. Things have changed. Things have shifted. The kingdom is not going to come. And they know, we told all these people to sell everything that they had and give alms, give it to us, and we've been doling it out, but we also know the bank account's getting low because we've been providing to every person as they have need, and there's a lot of needs. And remember, that's why they appointed Stephen to, to see to the ministering to the saints so that the distribution was made properly to the Grecians and not just to the Hebrews. That's why they appointed Stephen over that, that matter. So they've been giving this money out, but it's almost gone. And Peter says, and, and John and James, remember the poor saints at Jerusalem. Romans chapter 15. Paul says just there that we remember the poor, but in Romans 15 you find out where those poor are. Verse 25 of Romans 15. For now, but now I go to Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles be made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. So Paul says the churches of Macedonia and Achaia, they have taken a contribution for the poor saints at Jerusalem. Now, I want you to think about what a radical change. In Acts chapter 4, there was, was none among them that needed. None. They had everything they needed. By Acts 15, Peter, James, and John are saying to Paul, please remember the poor saints at Jerusalem. And in Romans chapter 15, Paul says, I'm taking this contribution to the poor saints at Jerusalem, and then I'll come to Spain. So, in that short amount of time, it, the, whole, the whole kingdom program came crashing down. And if there is anything that illustrates that better than this, this, this giving issue, I don't know what it would be. Because those saints, you know, they went from, neither said there any among them that there was need... That's what it says. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own. Neither was there any among them that lacked. They didn't lack anything. But by Acts 15, they lacked everything. So what happened? Was, was, what, Peter, was what Peter told them in Acts about selling all the, Was that a mistake? No. Peter, no, he didn't make a mistake. So what happened? Well, the kingdom didn't come. And now the gospel's out there among the Gentiles, and, and those Jews that believed are sitting there in Jerusalem with nothing. And, and as we said last week, you have to think about what a humbling thing it was for those Jews in Jerusalem to take money, to take stuff from the Gentile dogs to keep them going. I mean, the, their kingdom was supposed to come. They were going to be set on high above all nations of the earth. And they were going to lend to many nations and never borrow. Remember all those promises in the, in, the, in the prophets? And now here they are. And Paul, a man that much of the nation hated, is out there among the Gentile dogs trying to scrounge up some money to send to the church in Jerusalem. I mean, that had to be a humbling, humbling thing for those Jews.
I mean, it just, it, it, we, I think in, in our context, it's hard for us to, to imagine such a thing, but that had to be a humbling thing for them. And it's from that, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, it's from that that Paul is writing, much of the instruction that Paul gives on giving is, is precipitated by that event. And, and when he writes to the church at Corinth, especially the, the information on giving, he writes to the church at Corinth, it's precipitated by that event, by I'm taking this collection for the poor saints at Jerusalem in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, <coughs> what saints are those? Well, those are the poor saints at Jerusalem that he wrote about in Romans 15. I have given order to the churches of Galatia, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. We know that he wrote in the book of Galatians about Peter Wood, that we would remember the poor, the which I was forward to do. So he already told the Galatians about this. Now he's writing to the church at Corinth saying, verse 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Paul did not go to Corinth and hold a big crusade and say, everybody bring your money down and put it here. He didn't do that. He said, you, you guys, this is for the church at Corinth. You take care of this before I get there. I'm not the big, the big evangelist coming into town and passing around buckets for you to collect money. I want this done before I ever get there. And then in verse 3, and when I come... Whomsoever ye shall appoint by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. So you pick some people that you trust to take this money to Jerusalem. Because, of course, in this time frame, you couldn't just, you couldn't just wire it to their bank. You couldn't just write out a check and send it in the mail. You had to take the, the silver and the gold and, the, and whatever you collected, and you had to get it physically to Jerusalem. And that was a, a, quite a chore. So Paul said, you, you approve people by letters. You give them letters and say, we, we, we approve this person. We certify this person to take this money to the poor saints at Jerusalem. And that's what's going to happen. And so when you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, that's what's going on. Uh, he, 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 he has said, you take up this collection. If you look up in chapter 8, verse... Um, uh, chapter 8, verse 10. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it. So he, he's going back to when he wrote the other letter, and they, they started to take this collection, and, and now he says, let's, let's finish this up. Let's get this thing done. You, you had a willing attitude to do it. Now let's do it and get it done. So a lot of the, the instruction that he gives about giving here in 2 Corinthians is, is from, from that perspective. And it illustrates these are people, that ha those kingdom saints, they had a right attitude, an attitude of fear. They were expecting an answer from God. That is, he's going to bring the kingdom. They didn't get the kingdom, so now what? And Paul uses that occasion to talk to the church at Corinth about how would you give in the dispense. What they did, <laughs> because grace has come, is not going to work anymore. You can't do what they did. But how do you give? And he gives some instructions, just some, some general things. And as we said last week, the thing about grace is, in general, the, the instructions are not as specific. It's principles that we then put into practice in our lives. So for instance, Paul says, look in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So there's one thing. You should remember that God loves a cheerful giver. And, and you know, I told you this early on in the series, kind of you know, cut to the chase right up front. You should give as much as you can give cheerfully. If, if you go out that door, you put a $10 bill in, in that box, and you're happy about it, and you're cheerful, and it's good, and it's being used for good stuff, fine. But then you put a $20 bill in that box, and it's like, ugh, 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 I, ugh. I wanted to buy a new you know, whatever. And, 
then don't. Then don't. If you're going to make out a check for $100 and that's good and you feel good about it, good. But if 101 makes you say, oh, I don't know about that, then don't. And, and I'll tell you up front, if you're, if you're overwhelmed with credit card debt, don't write out anything to put in the box back there. All right? On any, in any event. So, so as you purpose, but here's, there's, there's the most important word in that verse is purposeth. You have to purpose. And purpose means I plan. God had a purpose that he purposed in Christ Jesus before the world began. Did God just wake up one morning and say, ah, I think I'll create a universe today. What the heck? Let's put Saturn out there. And let's... No. He had a purpose. He had a plan. Amen. And so the first thing about giving is it has to be with purpose. It's not just because, oh, I saw some guy on TV that said if I give him a hundred bucks on my, my already maxed out credit card, God will pay off my credit card. It sounds like a good deal to me. I'll buy that right along with the Vegematic. You know, yeah. No, that's not. See, and that stuff, you know, selling things that way is the same way, same way they sell stuff on QVC, right? If you watch QVC, how many times do you turn on QVC to, to watch it for, you think, I need this thing, and I've thought about it, and we've talked about it, and I need this thing, so I'm going to turn on QVC and see if I can get one. Is that how you buy things on QVC? No, you buy things on QVC because what? They told you you need it. You had no idea that you needed a slicer, dicer, pickle maker, did you? You had no idea. But then you turn on QVC and you find out, my goodness, how have I lived without a slicer, dicer, pickle maker for all these years? And so you buy it. See, and that's not purposing. That's not as you purpose, as you plan. Now, if you sit down and think about, you know, honey, I think if we had a slicer, dicer, pickle maker, our life would be so much better. And you think about it, and you think about what it's going to cost, and what, and what would it save, and da 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 And then you go on QVC, and you say, I wonder if on QVC they might have a slicer, dicer, pickle maker. Then you go on and check. Okay, that's purposing in your heart, but that's not the way. And those guys on TV, they're trying to get you to give. It's not because you purposed in your heart. It's because you happened to turn on the TV that night, be surfing through the channels, and they were having their begathon, and you said, oh, there's some guy got his credit card paid off by sending some money to that guy. That's what I'm going to do. And that's absolutely contrary to the way God tells you to give. He says, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. So we know that. You've got a purpose in your heart. If you look back over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, but he says this, verse 8 of 2 Corinthians 8. I speak not by, com well, start, start at verse 7. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. What grace? Well, the grace that we're, we're giving, we're taking up this collection for the poor saints at Jerusalem. And, and, and I want you to abound in this grace also. Then he says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forest of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. Then he says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And then he says, jump down to verse 12, For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to, the man, to what a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. I mean not that other men be eased, and ye burdened. So this, when you read Paul's instructions about giving, it's, it's sort of like you get whiplash. Because, well, look at one other, look at over in chapter 9, verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, but he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And that's talking about spiritual things. Well, we're talking about both. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But Paul says, you know, first he says, well, you give as you purpose in your heart cheerfully, as much as you can give cheerfully. But then this other verse says, but remember, it's kind of like when your mother says to you, now I'm not going to tell you what to do, but just remember this. And then what she says after that is so much worse than if she just told you what to do. 
right? She'll, she'll, she'll give you some principle or some platitude and say, don't remember this. Da, 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 and, 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 then you, so, and, and from that, you're supposed to decide what you should do, right? And you just say, just tell me what you want me to do. Okay, that's it. No, that's not, that's not, the, way, it's not the way moms work. So what Paul does, he'll say, you should give as much as you can give cheerfully. But then he says, and then he says, and I speak not by commandment. I, I'm not going to tell you how much to give. But remember that our Lord Jesus, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Now don't forget that. So it's kind of like your mom says, I'm not going to tell. God, Paul says, I'm not going to tell you how much to give. I speak not by, the, the, by commandment. I'm telling you to give as much as you can give cheerfully. But remember this. How much did Jesus Christ give up for you? Everything. Everything. Okay, just wanted to mention that. You can do with what you want. I'm not telling you, you don't have to give anything. There is no commandment. But remember this. <laughs> How much did Jesus Christ give up for you that you might be rich spiritually in him? He gave up everything. All right, just remember that. But then on the other hand, uh, it's accepted according to what a man hath, not according to what he hath not. So don't, if you don't have any, don't feel bad about, about not giving. But on the other hand, if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. And if you want to reap bountifully, you're going to have to sow bountifully. So he gives you, it's like, okay, all right, um, uh, I don't have any commandment. Oh, that's good. But remember what Christ did. Oh, that's bad. Oh, but I, I, I don't want you to give more than you can. Oh, that's good. Oh, but if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. Oh, and you're back and forth. And he gives you all these principles. And you know what he says then do an adult son of God to do? You need to decide. You need to purpose in your heart. You can't go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 8. If any provide not for his own, and especially they of his own household, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. Does God ever expect you to give to the point where you can't provide for your own? Because then that would be wrong, right? So is providing for your own, is that serving the Lord as much as putting money in that box back there? Yeah. It absolutely is. It absolutely is. Um, he says, if a man will not work, neither should he eat, so eat your own bread with quietness. Is that serving the Lord to do that? It absolutely is. So, so see, as, and, and you get back to that verse where Paul says, I speak not by commandment. I speak not by commandment, but I'm telling you, here are all the principles about money and what you do with it. Um, turn over to uh, Philippians chapter 4. Well, first get 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, then we'll go to Philippians 4. 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul says this, verse 3, if any man, so this is, these are the verses that come before that verse 10 that we've been starting with. 1 Timothy 6, 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words wherein cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Can you think of any better description for most of evangelical Christianity today than supposing that gain is godliness? If you, if you're, you watch the typical Christian begathon on TV and if you don't have money, you're poor, you're broke, you're in debt, you're whatever. Why is that? Because you didn't give enough. Because you didn't do enough. Because you're not godly enough. Because look at all the stuff we have here. You know, we got this, we got that, we got these big buildings. Got the, and that's because we're very godly. 
And when you're very godly, what will God do? He will bless you. Back to these two. If you're very godly and you give very properly, then God will bless you. Press down, shaken together, running over, will men give into your bosom. If you do it right, God will bless you. Supposing that gain is godliness. And what does Paul call those people? They are men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. You know that question my mom, well if these are good Christian people, why would they say, you know what they are? They are men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. And they try to teach people gain is godliness. And what's Paul say to do to those people? <laughs> From such withdraw thyself. <laughs> Get out of here. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. As Paul, as we've been reading each week. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. Wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You know what Paul's saying there when he says, I, in whatsoever state I am, I've learned to be content. And you tie that with 1 Timothy chapter 6, that, that godliness with contentment is great gain. You know what he's saying? Never tie your view of God to what you have. Never tie God's view of you to what you have. You know what the... the the Christian, quote unquote, Christian world tells you to do, you tie God's love for you to what you have. If you have a lot, <clears throat> it's because God has blessed you and he must really love you. If you don't have much, it must be because you're not doing something right and God is not blessing you. Can you be content if you feel like God is against you? and keeping things from you, and keeping you from succeeding, and all the rest? How could you be content with that? But if your contentment comes from knowing, it was great we sang that song before I came up to preach, in the Beloved, if your contentment comes from God sees my Savior, and then He sees me, in the Beloved, accepted and free. And what Paul had learned was, if I am in a prison in Philippi, naked and singing hymns at midnight, God sees me in Christ. If I am in Caesar's palace in Rome, living pretty good, even though I'm in jail, but I'm living pretty good, or if I have, I, I abound because of the things the church of Philippi sent me, God sees me in the beloved. If I have a little, if I have a lot, God sees me in Christ. If I am prospering, God sees me in Christ. If I am being abased, God sees That's why Paul says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Because no matter what, I view myself as God views me. Complete in Christ. In the beloved, accepted and free. If I am in bonds physically, am I still free? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. If I am rejected by all men, all they in Asia have turned away from me, am I still accepted in him? Absolutely. And that's where contentment comes from. See, contentment is not, not necessarily, you know, he's not saying, well, it's, it's terrible to have a lot of money, it's terrible this, this. he's saying, don't tie your value to those things. 
Don't trust, he says in, in verse 17 of that passage in 1 Timothy 6, don't trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, which give us all things richly to enjoy. Your trust, your value, your esteem of yourself. We, you know, everybody, oh, I've got self-esteem problems. You know, self-esteem is not man's problem. Pride is man's problem. If you want to learn proper esteem, you esteem yourself as God does in Christ. You see yourself as God does in Christ. This, this issue of, of money and giving and stuff is much bigger than just, you know, I got a hundred bucks, what do I do with it? it? It goes to, this idea of contentment goes to who do you see yourself as? How do you view yourself? In, is, is, is who you are about that money that you have or is it about the fact you're in Christ? Turn to, um, turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. We read earlier the passage that says, if you, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow abundantly, you'll reap abundantly. Uh, here's what Paul, Paul adds to that in Galatians chapter 6. He says this in verse 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate to him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man is soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. At verse 8, verse 7, Whatsoever man soweth, that shall, that shall he reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption. Does that mean that, that when you sow to the flesh, it's sinful? No. no, it doesn't. But it does mean that when you sow to the flesh, you reap corruptible things. But do you have to sow some stuff to the flesh? Because yes. if you don't, then you're back in Acts, right? Sell all that you have, give alms, come and follow me. And that's not our... Because what happened to the, to the Jews that did that? They're out getting money from the Gentiles. So he's not saying you, you, you shouldn't sow to the flesh. He's just saying... What you sow to the flesh, so you sow to the flesh. Thankfully, you all have clothes on this morning here. That, that is a prime example of sowing to the flesh. Because what are those clothes covering? Your flesh. Yeah, they're covering your flesh. You're all going to go home to a house or an apartment or whatever. What is that for? Yeah, it has to have a place to put your flesh. You know, because it's raining outside. Hopefully it has a good roof on it today. Or you're going to be in trouble. That's sowing to your flesh. You're going to go out here on most of you and get in a car and take off down the road. What are you putting in that car? Your flesh. Some of you are going to go out, eat something at a restaurant after a while. What's that, what, what's that doing anything for? Your flesh. Doesn't do anything for your spirit, does it? Oh man, look at that steak. My spirit just, oh, Wow. I feel so close to God when I eat that steak. No, it's for your flesh. So we all sow to the flesh. You have to sow to the flesh because we live in a body of flesh. But Paul's just saying, remember what you sow to the flesh. Your clothes, your house, your car, the food, all that stuff. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. It's corruptible. It's going away. And in eternity, it's, it's going to be irrelevant. It's an, it's, a, it's an evil necessity now. Because we live in a fleshly, sin-cursed world. But then he says, He that soweth to the Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. The stuff you sow to the Spirit, the stuff that is for spiritual purposes, for God's work, for, to promote His word, to promote His truth, how long does that last? How, how, how long does a, a, a saved soul last? <laughs> forever. Forever. Forever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen. Right? So Paul's just saying, 
When you sow, uh, God is not mocked, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. If you sow a whole bunch of stuff to the flesh, then you're going to have a whole bunch of stuff in the flesh. And if you sow a whole bunch of stuff to the Spirit, you're not going to see the stuff you have, but there, you're going to have a whole bunch of stuff laid up for you in heavenly places. And then what he says to us as mature adult sons of God is, you need to purpose in your heart and in your mind, what are you going to do? Where do how much do you want to sow each place? And remember all these principles. Remember that, um, that, that, that you, you, you do it cheerfully. But remember that Jesus Christ gave all for you. But remember that I'm not asking you to give beyond your means because he that doesn't care for his own is worse than an infidel. But remember, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. Remember all these things and then you decide, purpose in your heart, as a mature adult son of God, what you'll do. Now that's very different than the law. That's very different than the kingdom. But it's what grace is. So, so we, we keep all those principles in mind. And then the main, if you remember only one word of today's message, purpose. As you purpose in your heart. Amen. Make a decision. about It's not haphazard. It's not, it's not the way you shop on QVC. It's deciding when, where, how much, for what reason do I give. Think about it. And purpose in your heart. Let's bow our hearts down a word of prayer. God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ, for the opportunity of looking at your word and studying it together this morning. As we've done so, we pray that the things said and done are about honor and glory to the name of Christ, been edifying to the saints, and helped encourage us to purpose in our hearts as we give. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.